Welcome back to Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and this week's guest is Chrislyn Chu. Chrislyn is a storyteller, which takes shape in the form of writing, photojournalism, video, and in her daily life. She's young, but already highly accomplished, with a degree in neuroscience from Duke University and a regional Emmy Award for her work in harvesting clean energy from pickle water, which I had no idea was even a thing. She is also a curious inquirer of different cultures and a dedicated student of the nature of identity. Chrislyn is on an ever-evolving identity reclamation project of her own, currently on a mission to discover the parts of herself that have strong roots in China. And we had a really fast but thought-provoking conversation, ranging from identity issues to dealing with the effects of generational trauma and much more. What's funny is that what was planned as essentially a mentoring meeting with us yesterday turned into an impromptu interview request for me. I first met Chrislyn at the EO event that I posted a recording of last week, and I was struck by just how present and engaged she was in serious issues but with a sense of humor and perspective that seemed pretty unique to me. As far as having her on the show, as we started talking in our meeting yesterday, I realized that she is on a unique China adventure herself, and I thought her story would be relatable to a lot of people now, and to more and more as people like her, Americans and other foreigners who are ethnically part of the Chinese diaspora, return home to rediscover their Asian roots. So I was very happy to invite her to share it here, and I hope you enjoy it. This episode of Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Stackery. Stackery is the global leader in international parcel forwarding from the U.S. to anywhere in the world. The way it works is that you shop at any U.S. retailer, have your packages shipped to your Stackery address, and once everything has arrived, Stackery consolidates your stuff and ships it to you anywhere in the world, even China, saving you up to 80% off the shipping costs versus shipping things directly from the stores. Stackery provides free storage, same-day consolidation of your packages, and a tax-free U.S. address for you to use. Sign up today via the link in the show notes and use the offer code BIGFISH at the checkout. That's BIGFISH, all one word, to save 10% off your first shipment. All right, that's all I've got for now. Now, please enjoy my interview with Chris Lynch. Chu. All right, well, I'm here with uh, Chris Lynch. Chu. Chris Lynch, how are you today? Doing great. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Well, this is pretty funny, and I will have done an intro before people are hearing this right now, so I'll have set this up a little bit. But we were totally just going to have a meeting, and we're talking, and I said, you know, you should be on the podcast. And your response was was what? How would you describe your response? Uh, disbelief? <laughs> What's going I, on? I wasn't I prepared was, for this. I was kind of shocked, to be honest. I walked in here expecting it would be, you know, a normal, normal coffee chat. Um, and when you invited me to, to share my story, I guess, um, you had, yeah, I was like, well, I guess this is why I came to China. I guess, you know, I came here to sign up for an adventure, get outside my comfort zone. And here we are, where I'm about to share hopefully something articulate. I have high confidence. I have high confidence in you being articulate. So uh, my traditional first question will get us kicked off here, which is tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and for you, why China? What actually brought you here? And then we will get into the details. Well, my name is Chrislyn. Um, I am fresh off the boat, to, so to speak, coming to Beijing. Um, I came here about a month and a half ago um, to improve my Chinese skills um, conversationally. Um, I am an American. I was born in New Jersey. Um, my parents are from Malaysia, um, but they are, I guess, part of the Chinese diaspora in Malaysia. Um, and I always grew up very much feeling in between um, in between the U.S. and also in between, in terms of between Asian countries. I remember my dad would always describe to me like, you know, America is a melting pot and Malaysia is also kind of a melting pot um, or perhaps a salad bowl um, where you have a lot of cultures, a lot of people there. And sometimes, you know, there is that shared Malaysian pride, but there's also a lot of, I think, like, you know, pride in being Chinese, pride in being Malay and Indian, all these different things. Um, and so I would often, you know, go back home with my parents over the summers feeling like, oh, how do I fit in here as well? But I love the food, you know, all those things that, that you associate with culture. I, I pride myself in being that. Um, but then there's always the, you know, oh, but I can't speak any of the languages my parents can speak. Hokkien, Malay, Cantonese, Mandarin, English. Well, okay, I can speak English. Yeah, as I say, English, <laughs> right. I have to give you a pass on that. Right. And so for a lot of those reasons and just always feeling like in between, but loving all the parts that I'm in between, you know, um, that kind of liminal space, I was like, you know, no better time than now. I'm 24. Um, I have some time to really figure out my roots. Um, 
Yeah. Well, this is you, you actually hit on it. Part of this, honestly, the fact that you're 24, but you're smart enough to say things like liminal space. <laughs> this is part of why you're on the microphone right now, because I really appreciated what you were telling me. And I won't tell tales because you're going to tell the tale. <laughs> but especially, you know, let's let's talk about a little bit about what you were doing sort of with your life's work, you know, specifically as a storyteller. And then let's talk about the thematically the things we were we were talking about. We'll get into this in pieces, but talk about storytelling. What actually prompted you into that? I know that you do photography and video and writing and all kinds of things. So yeah, tell us about that. Well, I remember, um, I guess sometimes when people ask you why, right? Why do you do anything? Um, I think whoever is the first person to ask you that, they're doing something right. <laughs> you need more of those people in your life. Um, I think the first time anyone asked me why was when I had to write a college essay. And I was like, I do photojournalism stuff for the high school newspaper. I'm the visuals editor. I know I, I'm the photo person. I'm that person with the camera. But And I was like, this is what people know me for. This is what I love. But I cannot articulate why. And I felt like... Like, I've, I usually like going back to read what I've written, but I've never gone back to reread my college essays because I feel like whatever I wrote, that was something that was like Frankenstein to fit what I thought people want to hear. But I was like, I did not know how to articulate why I loved taking photos. And it took, you know, <laughs> like four, three, four years through college to really just be like, wow, I like taking portraits of people because I love stories and I love the power of, you know, connecting with an individual and, and that being a vehicle, like narrative transportation to, to connect with a larger universal kind of, you know, abstract, big human theme. Um, and what, and, and the, one of the pivotal moments for me was um, the summer, halfway through college, summer after sophomore year, um, I, I went on a documentary film project um, to Colombia, Medellin, Colombia, and South America. Um, and we were participating in what we called a translingual writing workshop, um, where we were working with local local university students, their artists um, that grown up in a lot of the like displacement and violence, uh, especially like with local gangs. Um, and those neighborhoods and just growing up with this tension of like our city is so beautiful and and we love like we love our communities but our hearts are also broken and we also have scars and how do we how do we capture all that and they were just in in this workshop um i remember when the artists were gathering there and we were working with them to like develop artist statements um, that they could use like in english and in spanish um, for their portfolios like the first day, a whole bunch of them just broke down crying, like even a couple sentences into sharing about their art piece. And and, and we learned later on that in, in I guess, South America, um, when people are taught to write, it's usually in a very formal, like business kind of sense. Like, you know, you just to keep the, leave the emotions out of it, you know, just keep it business. Um, and very unlike the whole, you know, college essay where it's like, pull your heart out, you know, pull on our heartstrings. Um, and, and so this was really the first time that a lot of, that many of those students felt like they could actually share their story and have those emotions. And I was like, really? Wow. I, I've taken that for granted. Right. Um, I didn't even realize that people didn't have that space. And I think just, just being a, a, not a spectator, but like a witness, I guess, to just the power of having space to tell one's own story and, and be heard and then, you know, to realize, oh, you know, I'm not alone. Um, and, and I, like my pain, this is actually not what defines me. And there could be a purpose in this and me sharing that um, there's strength in that and that can help other people. Um, like that is such a, like <laughs> that that is the thing that connects people right um and so i think i just came back from that summer and i was like whatever this was i want to be part of it this was what i was made to do um i i just want to use whatever skills i have to to let people have that freedom of just of just being known even just knowing themselves and then knowing other people and just being known um yeah so are you thinking that you're going to, um, do you see documentary as a career path for yourself? Potentially. Um, I want, um, yes, I don't think I would be able to stop documenting. I think I, 
I, I remember the day I realized that journal was the root of journalist. And I was like, I journal all the time. That's how I make sense of everything. And I don't think I will ever stop documenting um, my own thoughts and those of others. Um, but in terms of like industry or professionally, I'm not sure. Um, the place that I worked um, in in North Carolina before coming here to Beijing, I worked at a place called Story Driven. Um, and I feel so, so lucky to have had them as my first, you know, I guess formal workplace after college because what what they what we did was this hybrid of marketing and documentary and journalism, where basically, like if you like say Brendan, you needed a promo video for your podcast, right? And it's like, okay, why should people care? Well, if you use like story terms like hero and guide, it's like, okay, you're a podcast or you, the host, you are guiding your listeners, the heroes, right? On some kind of journey um, where they can identify, you know, with the journeys of the people that you're interviewing. Um, and they will be like, wow, you know, this has helped me somehow in my own life journey, right? And so like we would create these marketing videos for brands, for companies, for nonprofits, whatever, that were just like changing their their space in the world with like a really really kind of hopeful they were redeeming something um restoring something and creating these documentary style testimonials or stories where we'd be like okay we don't want to use marketing to sell story like we want we want to tell stories we want to keep it authentic um so that's so i'm kind of like I know enough about how hard the documentary world is and, and how draining it is um, to fundraise and write all the grants. And I have so much respect for people who do that. But there is a part of me that's like, how do we do this sustainably? And, and I've seen that it's possible to do that with story driven. They uh, actually have it as their business model right. and their success. It's, it's I, I, I've, I've yeah. heard of them, sure. Okay. I, I know of those guys, yeah. And you went, and you went to Duke, right? Yes. Right. And so this was your first job out of school. Yes, <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, pretty fortuitous. Would had you known of them prior to stumbling upon it, or was it like a was it a serendipitous thing? Um, it was. It was quite serendipitous. Um, I was actually interested in a fellowship um, that was offered through Duke, and it's this one year fellowship where they place um, recent graduates with local organizations that align with what they want to do professionally, vocationally. Um, and so I talked to the director and was like, I love storytelling, but I also studied neuroscience and really geek out about storytelling. So I'm not just looking for like any kind of video production company. I'm exactly. looking for people who are crazy about story and think about it on a meta level. And, and my director was like, I met a person on the plane. We were going to the same conference. I was attending. He was filming it. Let me get back to you. And that guy was now my, my, my boss <laughs> at Story Driven. So yeah. that was how the connection worked. And I started off as a fellow the first year and then transitioned to being an employee. So part of what's interesting for me about this interview and what's unusual is that you are not the typical guest. You are actually not even living here full time. Technically, you're here on a tourist visa, yes? Yep. So um, let's talk a bit about why you're here and what it is that sort of led you here, both the actual mechanical parts and then the bigger uh, philosophical and personal parts, which is what, what actually really was the most fascinating thing to me. Well, um, the big kind of boot that just kicked me over here in terms of urgency, like I can't put this off any longer was I was, I've been in a long term, dis a long distance relationship with my boyfriend who I met in college. Um, and he came over to China, um, to work uh, right after graduation in May, 2016, um, that year. Um, and so that was a, a big impetus for me not putting off <laughs> coming to China. Um, but I think besides that, or I guess in addition to that, um, it, ha it has been on my mind for a while um, to to actually make that step and, and take time to learn the language. I think that that's something that I've always associated a lot of shame with. Um, I, I actually went to Chinese school for like almost 10 years growing up in the US. It was the Saturday school kind of thing. I, I became a very good test taker. I was really good at memorizing characters and I could, you know, so like I can read and I can write um, quite well. And 
And so <laughs> when I look at characters here now, I feel like I have all these characters in my head and they're all these people that I've met before, but I've forgotten all your names. So, like that's how it feels when I'm here. Um, but in, at home, we never spoke anything um, besides English. And so just that conversational ability and just using all the vocabulary that's underdeveloped. And so um, I definitely always in Chinese school felt like like I hear all these other people, their parents are quote unquote real immigrants from mainland China. My parents are from Malaysia. Um, I don't really, in my Chinese, I don't really know, but I, but whatever it is, I don't feel like I belong here. Um, and so there's always just been that shame and I've like, haven't really known what to do with it. Um, and I'm like been trying to get over it and I'm just like, okay, I need to learn language. Um, so yeah, I'm basically like doing conversational classes while I'm here and I love it. Um, I really, really love, um, like those moments of when you, you're, you're actually understood and you actually understand something. Um, it sounds so basic, but, but they, they make, they make all the, all, you know, the mental gymnastics of like, I'm speaking so simply right now and it's frustrating, um, but they make it worth it. Um, and I have a couple of local friends that I've met where literally just the other night we were walking down the street and they were like, Oh look, you can see the stars. Like that's rare in Beijing. You can see the stars at night. And I love looking at the stars. And next thing I know, I'm asking them, you know, how do you And this is this is in Chinese. Yeah, this is yeah, yeah this is in they're Chinese. Not, they're, so, yeah. they're commenting in Chinese yeah. and you're talking. They in they can they cannot really speak English. Yeah. So which, which is good from a learning sure, perspective. Really sure. good for me from a learning perspective. And so I was like, I used to know how to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. And I forgot, can you teach me? In Chinese. In Chinese, oh, okay. yeah. And, and next thing you know, we're skipping down the street at like eight <laughs> o'clock at night and they're teaching me how to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. And somehow I'm communicating to them like, oh, you know, like you're like a Disney princess and next thing you know, like birds are gonna come flying. And I'm like, I'm, I'm actually making a joke. I'm actually trying to be funny in Chinese and they understood and like, <laughs> I was like, wow. This feels great. This is this is mo it's like little moments like that, just that wonder of learning again, I guess. Um, just you know, being known and knowing people. Like, I was like, this is why I came to China. Um, and then in terms of just other events that were happening closer, that actually was like, I am thinking a lot about this. I can't avoid the fact that I'm thinking a lot about Asian American identity. Is um, I think the last couple months there were just a lot of. Um, I, I had a lot of friends from college um, who actually stayed on in Durham as well and were involved in, in, in different ethnic identity related things, whether at church um, or on campus. Um, and they were having a lot of conferences that were bringing students together from different schools to talk about identity. And I would find myself, you know, being invited to either, you know, help cook a bunch of food for all the students, but I was there, you know, and, and there as like an extra mentor to facilitate group discussions, or um, I was there like to speak on a panel, like that, those kinds of things. And just realized, and, and just coming out of those events, just being like, wow, there are so many students who don't realize that their ethnic identity matters and it's important. And for whatever reason, there are a lot of reasons, but for whatever reason, they, they've internalized this story that says, like, this part of me doesn't really matter, or this is a part of me that is actually, like, like a burden to have, and it's something that I wish I didn't have, or it's something that seems, um, like, like it's somehow a barrier to my success or it gets in the way of people seeing me as a whole person. And so for me to be seen as a whole person, I need to take this part of myself and stand apart from it, stand at a distance from it and not associate myself with that. Um, I mean, there are a lot of stories of ranging from, you know, the stereotype, the, the stereotypical, like, you know, people who made fun of your, your food, your, your Chinese food that you brought to school. Um, to just feeling like, oh, you know, it, I, I'm not going to be seen equally when I apply for a job or when, or little like microaggressions of, oh, you know, like that's your language. Like, but, like, what are those weird characters? And just like little things like that. That's just another reminder, like, oh, you know, I, I'm an American, but there's this feeling like I need to prove that I actually am like who I am. And you can, and it gets tiring to, to try to keep proving like, 
what you're who you're not and it's like i would rather just use my energies to like talk about who i am (laughs) rather than talk about who i'm not like get your boxes away from me and as a storyteller i understand like archetypes right like those are so useful like and and even from a neuroscience perspective like they exist for a reason they help us make shortcuts in communication right to be able to communicate more efficiently but when they don't capture the or when they blind us to the nuance of reality and the complexity like every single no no person is a stereotype um when you dig far enough like it yeah basically i came here because i was tired of spending my time feeling like just complaining about the boxes and i was like you know like i actually want to tell my story instead of tell my not story or tell like what i'm not so i was like all right i'm gonna come here and start trying to learn learn some words, you know, in my quote-unquote mother tongue and and try to figure out, like, what are ways that I've been socialized to even look down, you know, upon other Chinese people or look down on myself for being um, Chinese and actually taking pride in that so much that I would want to share that with other people and celebrate that. Um, and, I mean, just the other week, my Chinese teacher, she... <laughs> she she's really interested in Beijing opera and she's like the senior in college and I was like wait young people actually like Beijing opera I thought everyone thought it was you know annoying <laughs> um and and then she invited me and I went and I was like wow you know this is definitely different but I'm actually really enjoying it yeah. and, and you start to pick up on the rhythm and like you just start to appreciate that quirky friend you know for being that quirky friend instead of judging them as being strange right and I and I actually got really into it and loved you know reading some of the like understanding the story and appreciating some of the some of the euphemisms but also some of the really clever like high level language and metaphors that they would communicate um, through the storytelling um, basically just appreciating this traditional form of storytelling and kind of being like, wow, you know, it would be amazing, you know, if, if I were to ever get to a place where I felt like, you know, I, I can tell a story that is like a Chinese story and feel that it's authentic. I would love to be able to tell it in the, in a medium that, that reflects, that honors, that, um, like learns from, you know, traditional, (laughs) <laughs> storytelling, like storytelling traditions, um, whatever those are. Um, and so that was, that was another moment that was like, oh, I'm glad I came, you know, whatever happens here, like no regrets. So in terms of telling stories and getting in touch with your identity as, you know, kind of reclaiming or, you know, claiming this identity for yourself, basically not having something imposed on you, not having it be whatever cutout someone wants to use or not even having it be that, that shorthand that is, it's it, like you said, it exists for a reason and it's convenient, but it's, but it's also limiting when people make these, these assumptions. Um, what are some of your assumptions that have changed dramatically in the, let's say, two months you've been here. This is part of why I wanted to get you on here, because I thought you'd have an interesting hot take on this. How is your, how have, what were your perceptions and expectations, and then what's the reality as you're sitting in it now? So one of the things that I distinctly have complained about with friends in the United States, other Asian Americans, um, is, ah. Oh, Asians are so passive. <laughs> like, why are like why are all of our and obviously generalizing, but we're we're speaking to trends that we see mm-hmm. um, when we make these absolutist kind of statements. Um, but like, why are all of our you know a lot of our parents or a lot of um, even other Asian Americans that we see as either like you know apolitical or just kind of complacent or they quote unquote buy into the narrative of like you know just put your head down, don't cause trouble, just like play by the rules and and you will that will get you far, that will help you achieve your American dream. Like just play by the rules, um, assimilate right um, as as you've been told to, um, don't cause trouble, right? And and that's something that we've. Yeah, that we we will complain a lot about. Um, and I remember, you know, oftentimes thinking like when I would talk to my parents, you know, about even their experiences in the workplace and when they encounter something that that really wasn't fair, really wasn't just. And I would ask, you know, so what, did you speak up for yourself or did you try to communicate how you felt? Um, there would be this kind of this this resignation or passivity, but there would be the anger, but they wouldn't act upon it. And I would be there, sit there, be sitting there like, how do you how do you let them do this to you? Right. Like, 
I don't, I don't understand. And, and, and over time, um, I think from, from one, talking to my parents more <laughs> um, and, and expanding my own understanding of their stories, um, and then to coming here and hearing, learning more about like history of um, some of the early, like even just activists and community organizing that happened in, among Chinese communities in the U.S., um, and then just meeting people here who are Asian and who are Chinese and have and have opinions, right? And they have strong opinions. Um, I'm like, wow, <laughs> Asians are not passive. Yeah, my Chinese friends here are not are not shy about their opinions. Right. You know, they're they're as they're as outspoken as anyone. But I, what do you think that is? Do you th- do you think that's that that has to do with in the case of like your parents? Um, being in a foreign country and wanting to try to assimilate and not sort of ruffle feathers, but here people are home and so they can okay. they're home. So at, at home you can put your shoes on the you can put your feet on the table. You know you don't do that at your if you're visiting somebody's house, right? So maybe they're more comfortable being because they're at home and they can speak their mind. I think that's definitely part of it. Like like you know safe space, right? Safe and brave space. Um, at the same time, I think there is a large element of generational trauma, um, generational communication or lack thereof. Um, yeah, I, I, one of my, one of my friends, um, who, who stuck around in Durham and is working with a lot of, um, Asian American students to think about identity. Um, one day I remember we were like, wow, why don't we just quit our jobs and just devote our lives to just telling the stories of our elders, like that sounds amazing, and I and 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 we're we're like not gonna let ourselves, you know, default on or, or avoid that, um, or push that off. Um, and 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 where that, I remember where that passion came from. We were just sitting there and we were like, you know, there's someone with with a grandmother who who and this is a Korean American and their grandmother crossed from North Korea to South Korea riding on top of a train. You know, and, and when you wow. and when you're like when you hear a story you're, you're like that, you're like, wow, you know, that is a really interesting case of someone engaging in, you know, quote unquote, illegal border crossing uh, that might actually connect them to stories that you've heard of people of of undocumented immigrants on the North American continent and North and South American continents. And, and you start connecting those dots of like like solidarity and shared struggle. And it's like and that starts to break some of those uh, preconceptions about, oh, you know, one group is passive, one group will take risks and one group won't take risks. Um, and just even recognizing that in like our own families. Um, I mean, my, my grandmother, my dad's mom, she sold her house to buy my dad a one-way plane ticket to go to college in the United States. Wow. Right. Like that is, that is a huge risk. That is yeah. not passive. That is very, very, very no, ad- proactive. No, no pressure on your dad. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and so, and so a lot of these things where older generations, like, and, and also just with, you know, technology and everything growing so fast that each generation, how they grow, the world around them looks different growing up. Right. But like, okay. So with that environmental context, like each generation wants to protect each older generation wants to protect the younger generation from having from having to go through whatever pain whatever struggles they've had and that can include silence or that can include being expressed through silence where it's like you know we don't want to talk about what we experienced um you know in this tumultuous period of history in our homeland because we like we don't want your lives to be like that and, and also it, it pains us to also talk about that, especially sure. if they've never processed it with anyone. Um, it can be painful to relive that trauma when you tell it. And so, and so I think there's a lot of, the, like, uh, they, to answer your question, I think realizing that there's a lot of generational trauma that leads our elders to want to protect us, right? It comes from such a loving place. They want to protect us from that. And that's why they they don't pass on these stories. It's how we become a lot more understanding and not be so critical. Um, and but at the same time, I do I do lament like like when when younger generations who have grown up with more privileges and more freedoms um, than older generations and they don't understand the stories and of all the sacrifice and all the hard work and all the blood, sweat, and tears that enabled them to have what they have, right? Then they grow up without that gratitude and without that humility that would then lead in 
the same generosity to to keep passing forward or you know to just be generous and treat everyone as your neighbor and um you know common yeah shared humanity um and so and so there definitely is a there is a need for those stories to be shared so that people know you know where, where is where is all that i have where does that come from who do i have to thank I mean, that's why I love stories like Moana and Coco. Um, whether it's a Pol- Polynesian culture or Mexican culture, the, the basic story arc is, you know, here are people who have lost memories, who have forgotten who they are, who they, who they truly are. <laughs> um, and when they forget, they live out of fear. And, and, they're, and when you think about, like, a, a posture of, you know, are your hands tight and closed and, and like gripping onto something because you're afraid, right, to let go and you're afraid um, of instability or, but you're, you're afraid versus the posture of like, you know, hands open and you have, you, you're able to love and give because you have so much love to give and you know who you are and you love that, you know why that's meaningful, why there's purpose for that in the world and you can be generous and like love from abundance. Like, like that's what I see in those movies where I just see, you know, Moana and Miguel like going on these journeys where they've like, where they're like, I feel like deep down, you know, I am an explorer (laughs) and like, you know, they can't shake these things out of me. And now they have to go on this journey to rediscover those roots. And then when they're able to remember, right, they're able to help the rest of their community remember as well. And, and, and there's like this corporate, this collective awakening, right? And, and I'm like, that's what I want to see in the world. Like, what would it look like, you know, for, for Chinese Americans, for, for any kind of diaspora people, right? Um, who, who feel like, like they have so many parts of themselves that all define them and are, be- and are all beautiful, but then they have these you know, these categories of, oh, this is what it means to be a, a, a full, legitimate American. This is what it means to be a full, legitimate Chinese person. Like, th- those categories will change depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> I mean, just, you know, being being Chinese, right? Like, I asked one person and they're like, oh, you know, being Chinese is a way of life. It's, you know, being hardworking. It's having these values. It's it's even like, you know, really loving money. You know, they'll put all these <laughs> all these kind of values into it. Oh, that's what it means to be Chinese. But then there's a whole like, oh, you know, you're Chinese if any member of your family ever came from China and it's more of a, you know, biological, um, F, F, yeah, F ethnicity kind of thing. Right, right. Um, or you know, or you can speak the language. Like it, it will, it will depend. And so when, when, when the definition is going to change like that, it's like, well, where do you anchor your identity in exactly? And for me right now, that is a question that I'm really curious. Like, how do you, like, where do you anchor your identity when your identity has so many pieces to it um, that have so many definitions? And how do you know, like, what is a definition that you can actually trust and, like, live out of with the same, like, wholeness that you see, you know, Moana and Miguel and their families live out of at the end of those movies? Um, And so as we just think about how you know, the whole world is becoming more and more multi-ethnic, like, that's where we're headed, like, with globalization and just, you know, mobility, right? Literally physical mobility. Um, and I, I, was, I was just given a book by a friend that I hope to read that is about multi-ethnic Asian American identities mm-hmm. where you have people ranging from, you know, a Mexipino <laughs> to like, you know, a Black Gnawan and, you know, we're, 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 construct, we're, we're creating new language because we're like, we don't currently have language that captures the complexities of our categories, our ethnic identity categories. And so we're creating new language to try to capture that. But, but basically, as the world is moving towards being more multi-ethnic and more blended, I'm wondering, you know, what, how do cultures interact um, such that, like, you know, a new culture is created? Um, like, when you talk to a, a lot of folks who are biracial or multiracial, um, some of the stories I've read, they'll share... Oh, you know, I've I've learned to take pride in you know X culture and Y culture. They're both part of me, and I recognize how you know when I'm in the country of X culture, you know I might certain things might be emphasized more, or 
people will be more surprised by certain things, but like I just focus on, you know, what, why am I, why am I proud to be part of that culture? And I celebrate that and I invite other people to celebrate that when I'm in Y culture, same thing. And you know what? It's okay that I'm not fully purely x or purely y like i am you know this x cross y whatever (laughs) thing and that's awesome um and you know what i am in this position to be like almost like a cultural ambassador in a way like a like a code switcher like this person that can that like like your strength is being adaptable and i think going back to that question you asked of, you know, how has my thinking just changed being here? I think it's, it's definitely gone from being like, oh, you know, we're so passive to being like, oh, you know, we actually have strengths. Like there is a strength to being um, someone with kind of a fractured identity in that you learn to be really adaptable and you learn to, to, to empathize and see things from a lot of different perspectives. You're, you're able to realize that like there is not one way of like, there's not one normal. (laughs) Um, there's not one, like if you draw from the fish out of water analogy, there's not one kind of water. There's not one way the water flows. Um, they can have different colors and you know, a whole lot of other stuff going on in it. Um, and all of them have their strengths and, and so I think that adaptability um, is a strength that I'm recognizing that I am like, like that's what I see in my parents that like, you know, they left their home countries and came to the United States and they've been able to provide me and my brother with a very comfortable upbringing. And, 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 and I, I've totally taken that for granted. And in the past where I've criticize them for being too passive um i think in the last like couple months or so even just thinking like preparing for this trip to china like i remember my dad was like um (laughs) i hope i hope you have fun learning to be an immigrant in a way and i was like i don't know if it's comparable to your experience (laughs) it's not um i can i can kind of leave whatever i want yeah your dad didn't Um, your dad didn't have an iphone to help him out yeah he did not have an iphone to help him out no google maps or anything or actually sorry baidu maps no baidu maps sure sure um yeah what's google yeah Uh, we don't we don't we don't support yeah i've got to do a bing and find out what a google is (laughs) um but basically i was just like wow like my parents are supporting me on this journey and I just wonder how they feel of, wow, like our daughter wants to use the, this money that we've saved up for her to, you know, have a great career, or whatever, but she wants to go back to Asia. <laughs> she wants to leave America. We raised her here in America so she can make a, a life here. Well, she wants to go back to Asia to explore her roots. Um, and there's a part of me that wonders if they, they may feel like, oh, you know, what, did we, did we fail in some way, you know, to like raise her with some strong sense of identity? And, and I, I don't know, I haven't had that conversation with them. Um, I don't know if they would share that with me per se, but, but, but it's something that makes me conscious of like, of like actually trying to communicate and and think about, you know, okay, this is what it's like for me now. How might, how does this help me empathize with their experience when they, when they were fresh off the boat or the airplane or whatever, when they came to the United States? Um, and how does my, how, how are, how are the things that I'm struggling with here? What are good questions that I can now think of to actually ask my parents? And so, I mean, even just coming here and being like, oh my gosh, People look at me and they think that I speak Chinese because I look Chinese and I can't speak Chinese because I didn't grow up in China. Um, it'll like it'll, it'll it'll just spark the question that I've never asked my parents before. Then of like you know how like how did you find community when you got to the United States? Like like how what did was there differences in how you like your experience with education? But and then and then my dad he came to a liberal arts school in the U.S. Um, my mom went to college in Australia. It's like mom, you know, what was your experience with da 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 da? And I had a really good conversation with her um, where she was just sharing about how because of like some financial constraints and and whatnot, like she actually didn't really have much um, opportunity to actually break out of just meeting other Malaysian people and making more friends because like she couldn't afford to stay on campus in a dorm because that was too expensive so she just stayed in an apartment like with another Malaysian person and stuff like that where I was like wow you know 
Like, and, and you know, it starts to sink in and you start to realize and start to be grateful. Um, and, and I think that that changes, that changes how you, how you just go forward into life instead of being entitled. Um, because, oh, this, some, some, someone did something to make this happen in my life, but I've always had this benefit in my life, so I should always have this benefit in my life. Like, you, you need to know, like, the past to understand why the present exists and think, you know, how can we create a future where other people can experience the richness of life that I also have? That is a perfect way to end this chapter one. I'm looking forward to another conversation when you've got more than two months here. I can't imagine what insights you'll have. Chrislyn, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to find out more about Chrislyn or some of the interesting things she talked about. There are a lot of links in the show notes for you. You can find the blog post at crazyinagoodway.com as always. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week.